The 1990 Tour de France is the 73rd in its colourful history. It comprises 22 stages and a total of 3,400 kilometres. The race starts at a prologue time trial of 6.3 kilometres at the modernistic theme park of Futuroscope on the outskirts of Poitiers. Among these huge glass structures, 198 of the world's best cyclists are waiting to start this race against the clock. Each of the 22 teams has three mechanics who check and adjust wheels, pedals, the tyres and the gears. One of the favourites to win the Tour de France is the PDM rider Raul Alcala of Mexico, who shows deceptive power. Alcala takes the lead with a time of 7 minutes 53.19 seconds. Gianni Bugno of Italy, the recent winner of the Giro d'Italia, expects to be one of the challengers. The Chateau Dax rider is a strong, stylish time trialist. But despite his style and a fast finish, his time is 21 seconds slower than Raul Alcala's and will be only the 29th fastest today. A year ago, the Tour Prologue was won by this man, Eric Brekink from Holland, another PDM rider and a teammate of Raul Alcala. But today, Brekink is below his best of Futuroscope because of a stomach virus. As he approaches the finish, his time will be outside of the best 20 riders, and that really is a disappointment. The Spaniard, Pedro Delgado, winner of the 1988 Tour de France, he'll always remember last year when he lost almost three minutes in this prologue time trial. He arrived late for the start, which was then in Luxembourg, but he's on time at Futuroscope. But as he approaches the finish, Pedro Delgado also concedes 20 seconds to the best time set by Alcala. Yet another race favourite is Laurent Fignon of France. The Castorama rally team leader won the Tour in 1983 and again in 84. He was second in 1989, that famous eight seconds margin to the American Greg LeMond. Back injuries made him a doubtful starter this year, but he still finishes 15th best. Sickness has also plagued Greg LeMond, the American who wears the yellow jersey as defending champion. But armed with the revolutionary new handlebar, Le Mans scorches around the 6.3 kilometres. As he turns for the finish, there's absolutely nothing in it. Raul Alcala is just five hundredths of a second slower. Greg Le Mans is on top. Thierry Marie, one of Fignon's French teammates, is not a race favourite, but he is a specialist of short distance time trialling. He won the stage in the prologue in the Tour de France in 1986. And here, he sprints to a brilliant winning time of 7 minutes and 49 seconds. The second day of the Tour has two more stages at Futuroscope, a 138 kilometres road race to be followed by a 44 kilometres team time trial. Only minutes into the first stage and there are four riders ahead of the race. At the front is the Frenchman Ronan Pensek of the Team Z. The Canadian Steve Bauer of 7-Eleven is at the back here and with them is Italian Claudio Chiapucci of Carrera and the Dutchman Franz Marsen from the Buckler team. The four gain ten minutes by half distance while a crash behind splits the field. Among the fallers is Pedro Delgado himself after trees were dragged across the road by political demonstrators. All of the riders, the mechanics fastly working with spare wheels, puts them back in the race. Delgado and the stragglers soon catch the peloton, but the leaders remain ten minutes ahead. Bauer is riding strongly in the front group. Bauer is the best of these four in the prologue time trial, and looks sure now to take the leader's yellow jersey away from the Frenchman, Thierry Marie. Bauer keeps up the pace right until the final sprint into Futuroscope to keep that 10-minute margin. But as the sprint begins, he can't hold off the strong challenge from Franz Marsen, 
who sprints to a fine stage victory. So the Buckler team of Holland score early on this year, a win for Franz Marsen, but it is the Canadian Steve Bauer who takes over the race leadership. In the afternoon, Bauer rides strongly for his 7-Eleven team, remembering the 1988 tour when he lost the leader's yellow jersey in this very team time trial. Now he defends a two-second lead over Marsen. The Dutchman's Buckler team ride well, but they will finish eight seconds slower than the American 7-Eleven team of Steve Bauer by the finish. The Carrera team is strong, but Kia Pucci, number 171, is struggling at the back. This team will concede 41 seconds to Steve Bauer's squad. And Greg LeMond leads the Z team. He hopes to push Pensek into the race lead. He was the fourth man in the breakaway this morning. They ride with style on the windswept course. This is Greg LeMond in second place, wearing the colours of the reigning world champion, the rainbow jersey. Their finishing burst takes them to a time of 54 minutes and 17 seconds, but this is five seconds short of an excellent time by 7-Eleven, and it will leave Steve Bauer in the yellow jersey. There's also a keen battle for the actual stage win, and this is headed by the Panasonic team from Holland. They used to be the past master of team time trialling, and they race home this time with the best time, 53 minutes, 24 seconds. Raoul Alcala's PDM team come close, but they are slow by having to wait for the sick Eric Brecking, and they finish seven seconds short of Panasonic. So the race then moved out of Futuroscope down to the city of Poitiers, the third stage heading northwest towards Brittany. It was a ride of 228 kilometers. Rain is forecast for this third day of racing as the 198 riders head out of town. Then, two hours into the stage, the peloton is again stopped by the organisers. Another demonstration, this time by agricultural workers, is blocking the road ahead. It's decided to take a 16-kilometre diversion on narrow back roads. It works, and the demonstrators have missed out. The voice of Jean-Marie Leblanc explaining that the race is temporarily neutralised. Then the rain comes, but the speed increases. Italian Moreno Argentin makes a break. And the small group behind take up the chase. But Argentin holds on to win the stage in Nantes by more than two minutes lead over the pack. Argentine, in the Tour de France for the first time, continues his great season. Not everyone knows that the Italian has even been clear at all, and Castorama rally rider Christophe Leven finishes and thinks he's won. Stage four will take the race north across the rolling hills of Brittany. A ride now of 203 kilometres to Le Mans Saint-Michel. The start is by the cathedral in Nantes, and the sun is shining again as the riders leave town. It's a pretty route too. It leaves via alongside the city's canals. To the official start, indicated here by a gendarme's flag. And Laurent Fignon, in pain after a crash the day before, is already likely to become soon one of the tour's first casualties. It's a much younger French rider, Gilles de Lyon, of the Helvetia La Suisse team, who makes the first attack. He's joined by the Belgian, Edwig van Hoyedonk from the Buckler team. The pair work hard, but they are soon caught. And then there is another solo attack from Soren Lilholt of Denmark. A sprint, and it goes to Olaf Ludwig from the Panasonic team, 15 kilometers from the finish. pack regroup and the dangers occur just behind the pack 
there is a crash and it's split into these groups. The front group of 50 pushes up the pace and fights out the finish at Mont Saint Michel. Ludwig in green leads the charge, but he goes far too early and has totally misjudged the finish. And as the pack come to the line, it's Belgian Johan Museu who sprints home for the win. Ludwig finishes only third. Laurent Fignon arrived in a group over 44 seconds behind. Stage five is the longest stage of the race, 301 kilometers across the hills of Normandy. It wasn't to be a happy day for Laurent Fignon, who's been suffering from the early hours of the day and isn't looking forward at all to the rest of it. The Frenchman, Thierry Claverola, sprinting for climbing points. He does all of this before the rain actually sets in for the rest of the day. The longest stage, and the wettest. The rain demoralizes Laurent Fignon even more, and although his fans still write his name on the street, the two-time winner drifts to the back of the field, and then finally decides to quit the 1990 Tour de France. Laurent Fignon drops away from the back of the field and searches for his team car. By the end of the day, he'd be watching the Tour de France on television. Ahead, race leader Bauer discusses tactics with his team director, Noel de Jonkera. And then he goes back up to the field. The greasy roads cause several crashes, including this one with former French champion, Eric Caritou, of the RMO team among the fallers. Then, with more than 70 kilometers still to race, it's the Dutchman Gerrit Zollerfeld and the Buckler team who breaks away alone. He rides powerfully to gain a massive lead of 10 minutes. And by the time he reaches the finish, he is still five minutes clear in Rouen. Another stage win for the Buckler team. Two riders then move ahead of the pack on the rain slick streets. And again, it's the Lotto team man Musiu, who's sprinting for second place. He was the winner yesterday at Mont Saint Michel. He takes second place ahead of fellow Belgian Etienne de Wilder, while at the head of the pack, it's the East German Olaf Ludwig. On the sixth day, the riders board a plane for a 600 kilometers flight to eastern France on the German border. Race director Jean-Marie Leblanc always seems to be working. But for everybody else, including Greg LeMond, they enjoy the rest. Next day's stage six takes the race to the spa town of Vitel, 202 and a half kilometers. It's raining again before the start, and it causes this gendarme to wave a yellow danger flag before a sharp left turn. But as the roads dry out, the speed dramatically increases. And the crosswinds cause several crashes again, including this one with rider number 68, Eric Van Lanker from the Panasonic team. He's the last to get up. And another with the Helvetia riders, Jean-Claude Leclerc and Guido Winterberg among the fallers, where a ZT mechanic retrieves the bike of race runner-up Ronan Pensek. It's a painful business on these opening days of the Tour de France, but the riders usually do remount and always catch up with the field. Six men fight out the uphill finish in Vitel, where Dutchman Jelle Nijdam gives Buckler its third stage win in this opening week with a well-timed sprint finish. Jelle Nijdam, whose father Henk was a world champion back in 1961, is a clear winner, ahead of Denmark's Jesper Skibbe and the consistent Johan Museu. The breakaway has done nothing to alter the overall lead. Only eight seconds later, Italian Adriano Baffi of Ariostia leads in the field. Stage seven is a time trial, an important one, 61 and a half kilometers long, over hilly roads between Vitel and Epinal. 
Favourites like Le Monde are hoping to make up some of their 10 minute deficit here on Bauer by fitting bigger chain rings, disc wheels and much lighter tyres. In time trialling, all of the lightest equipment is employed. Every tenth of a second counts. The mechanics are just pedals, retape handlebars and tighten spokes in the quest for more speed. These are the bicycles that cost over $4,000 a piece. The riders are also well prepared with a good warm-up, even on a damp day. The weather is still dry when Pedro Delgado awaits his turn in the start house. The 1988 tour winner is launched onto the course. He knows just how important these time trials are, deciding the eventual winner of the Tour de France. He makes the most of the conditions storming along the road and taking risks on the descents. He's using his aerodynamic handlebars to cut through the wind to the fall. He arrives at the finish in an outstanding time of 1 hour 19 minutes and 10 seconds, and that is the time to beat. And this is a man who could beat it. Gianni Bugno is racing even better. And he will reach the finish 18 seconds better than Delgado. Delgado's young teammate, Miguel Indurain, also rides in the dry. And when he gets to the finish, he will take the lead 23 seconds better than Bugno. Back in Vitel, Le Mans has again chosen his extreme handlebars. He knows how hard he has to ride to beat Indurain, and he focuses all of his energy as he takes the countdown to his start. Despite the rain which is now falling, Greg LeMond is already catching riders who have started ahead of him. He storms through the 20 kilometers point 12 seconds better than Indurain and seems to be heading for victory. Mond literally buries himself. He tries now to set the best time of the day. At the start, Alcala mounts his machine. And he sets out at a seemingly suicidal speed. Quickly into his rhythm, Alcala climbs the hills out of the saddle. And pushing an enormous gear, Raul Alcala rides in a superb control style. And after only 20 kilometers, He's a stunning 45 seconds quicker than Greg LeMond. At the finish, LeMond is finishing slower than Indurain, Bugno and Delgado. While back in Vitel, the race leader Steve Bauer is determined to keep the yellow jersey. He's not a time trial expert, but his muscular legs hold tremendous power. Alcala is 90 seconds faster than Indurain, the best time at the arrival point. Meanwhile, Ronan Pensek sets out from Vittel, hoping he can make up the 34 seconds on Steve Bauer he needs to take over the race leader's yellow jersey. Bauer doesn't take any chances on the range slick turns into Epinol. And he comes into the finish with a steady 14th place. While Pensek risks everything. And he beats Bauer by 17 seconds, but it wasn't enough. Kiapucci also rides strongly to finish 15. Overall, Bauer now leads Pensek by 17 seconds, and Kiapucci here by a minute. With the Alps still two days away, stage eight gives the sprinters a last chance of a stage win. It's a ride of 181 and a half kilometers. The French teams, Castorama Rally, Toshiba and RMO, are particularly active in the wet over the early kilometers. They haven't won a stage since Marie's success in the prologue. A 
After 32 kilometers, the RMO rider Michel Vermotte of Belgium breaks clear. And nobody chases him. He's fighting a strong headwind. And halfway through the stage, his lead is up to almost 12 minutes. The peloton eventually organized their pursuit. Vermotte struggles in the strong wind, and after 120 kilometers alone, he's caught. And so in Bazançon, 13 riders have broken clear, and with Bruno Cornier still trying for the French win. But it's the green jersey of Olaf Ludwig who sprints in to give East Germany its first ever and its last stage win in the Tour de France. 21 seconds later, the peloton arrives, led home by the sprinter Adriano Baffi of Italy. The ninth stage takes in the steep ridges of the Jura Mountains into Switzerland, between Besançon and Geneva. It's a turning point for men like Brökink, Duclos Lazal, and Ronan Pensek. And riding out of Besançon alongside the River Doubs, Pensek leads the pack with Greg Lemond. In the hills, there's an attack by the Spaniard Eduardo Chozas and the Italian Massimo Girotto. They are chased by French champion Philippe Luvio from the Toshiba team. The French are still trying for that win. On the fast descent of the Col de la Fossile, where the pack is two minutes behind, the two leaders race on towards the finish. Then, 15 kilometers from Geneva, another Frenchman, Christophe Leven, sets off in pursuit. Christophe was the rider who thought he'd won back in Rouen the previous week. But Chozas and Girotto are out of reach, and Girotto easily wins the stage on the shores of Lac Le Mans. Levan stays clear of the pack, though, and he takes third place. He's followed home by Danish champion Brian Holm, Luvio, and the Swiss rider Yogi Muller. Then by a group led home by Gilles de Lyon. And finally, 37 seconds late, Museo sprints in at the head of the main field. What a sprinter this man is turning out to be. The whole field winds into Geneva for a very brief stay in Switzerland. Steve Bauer still wears the yellow jersey before stage 10, which takes them off towards the Alps. It's a ride of 118 and a half kilometers to the base of the beautiful Mont Blanc. The peloton at first seem reluctant to leave Geneva and they ride slowly past the city's most famous lake. The first climb sees an immediate attack. It's led by Roberto Conti of Ariostia, Cornier of Zed and Omar Hernandez of Postebon. And with them Patrick Robit of the Weinman team. The pack starts to split up. A head TVM rider, Jesper Skibby, is dropped from the leading breakaway. And the sprinter, Olaf Ludwig, is also dropped at the back. Eric Birkink is feeling better today and he animates the pursuit. From the pack, a small group emerges. Features Raoul Alcala on the far side, Charlie Motte nearest, and the boy in black there, the Belgian Claw Coquillion. This is Stephen Roach, an attack comes from the 1987 winner of the Tour de France, but he's chased all of the way by Z team's Robert Miller. In front, French climber Tiddy Claverola of Motte's RMO team, Conti and Rabit. Three of them work well together. By the summit of the Col de Colombier, Claverola is clear on his own. Roberto Conti is in second place. And this is Robert Miller who leads the pack. Ahead of Dutchman Steven Rux, Colombian, Fabio Parra, Alcala, Belgian Johan Brunil. Then comes Roach, and this is America's Andy Hamston. Pensek is here as well. And the tall Injurain lifts up his collar for the cold descent. The descent is a fast one. 
riders touching 80 kilometers an hour. But the pack soon climbing again, led here by Eric van Lanker and Charlie Motte on the right. Ahead, Motte's teammate Clavarola gains with every pedal stroke. He's riding like a man inspired. And at the Aravis summit, he's two minutes ahead of the pack. Roberto Conti is still chasing under the second place here. But the main group is led by Claudio Chiapucci, and they are not now very far behind. Clavarola speeds downhill to the village of Fume, while Conti is soon caught by the chase group. This group contains all of the favourites, no one is missing. A counter-attack containing Motte develops on the flat roads. We're 10 kilometres now before the uphill finish at San Gervais. And this final climb proves fatal to Steve Bauer, the race leader. Bauer is dropped by the group containing his immediate challengers, Pensek and Chiapucci. The Spaniard, Marina Lejareta of the Once team, sets the pace of the favourites group. Alcala's here, Delgado, Stephen Rux, Ronan Pensek and Eric Brerking. And further ahead, Motte has dropped all of the counter-attackers, except East German Uwe Ampler of the PDM team. But no one can catch Clavarola, who reaches the 4,600-foot summit finish at Le Betex with almost two minutes to spare. A tremendous ride by Clavarola, and behind him, it's Uwe Ampler and Charlie Motte who fight for the second place, with the East German just getting it. Delgado made a late counter-attack with Pensek, Lajareta, and the youthful De Leon at the back here. Delgado was fourth in this group. And although Pensek dropped back to the next group, he managed to gain enough time to take over the yellow jersey from Steve Bauer. So Ronan Pensek, as all the French would like, was now leading the Tour de France. But on the major leaders in the Tour, Delgado and Le Monde, you haven't lost a great deal. Um, well, you know, they still have to make up a lot of time and, uh, you know, I'm still in the bike race. Uh, you know, I lost the yellow jersey today, but uh, there's no means, uh, you know, completely out of the race. And uh, I'm still going to push myself and I'm, I'm still in the race. So, uh, you know, tomorrow's another day. You lost the yellow jersey today, but will we see you in it again before we get back into the mountains? Never know. Never know. And how do you feel about losing the yellow jersey? You've lost it before. Well, you know, I think uh, what, instead of losing it, I have to think about, uh, you know, the 10 days that I kept it. And uh, that's a great souvenir for my career. And, uh, you know, if I can get it back, I'll get it back. If not, then uh, I'll do my best race. Bauer is now down to third place overall behind Ronan Pensek and Claudio Chiapucci. Going into stage 11. It's the toughest stage with 16,000 feet of climbing over the Col de la Madeleine and the Glondon passes, leading to Alp d'Huez. It's 182 and a half kilometers. With long, steep gradients ahead, mechanics have fitted especially low gears. Climbing is the speciality of race leader Pensek, who tells reporters. It's great to be in the yellow jersey, especially for the climbs to Alp d'Huez. There are many anxious faces among the 180 riders and nine of them will have quit the race by the day's end. Approaching the Madeleine Pass, nervous riders touch wheels and Colombian William Palaccio falls down, with the fifth place, Raul Alcala. The Madeleine is 25 kilometers long, but a brisk pace is set by Johan Brunil of the Lotto team and in the white, Charlie Motte of the French RMO squad. Alberto Volpi is the other rider on the far right. About 50 riders are still together as the summit finally appears into view. Riding strongly near the front is the rainbow jersey of the world champion Greg Lamont.
And also looking comfortable is the man in the red spotted jersey, the leading climber of Clavarola. He's followed by Rooks and the race leader, Pense. Into the final kilometre of the climb, only 35 riders remain in the front group. Over the 6,400 feet summit, Clavarola sprints clear. Seven seconds later, he's followed over the top by the Spanish rider, Miguel Ingerain. And just behind, by Claude Coquillon and the rest of the leading group. After passing Clavarola on the Madeleine descent, Ingerain starts the Glandon climb 35 seconds ahead of the Frenchman and a minute ahead of the main group. Clavarola takes advice from his team director, Bernard Vallée, who as a rider once won the King of the Mountains, in fact in the 1982 Tour de France. Behind, the group is led by the Belgians Brunil and Claude Coquillon, the yellow jersey of Ronan Pensek, Claudio Chiapucci, Charlie Motte and Greg Lamond, who's back in the group after falling and dislocating a finger at a feeding station. This is the other American, Andy Hampston, the 7-Eleven team, and also here too is the Irishman, Sean Kelly. Rider number 41, the Spaniard, Marino Lajaleta. Clavarola is now three minutes in front and has caught Miguel Ingerin. While behind, Le Mans Z team keeps the pace steady, led by Norwegian Atle Volsvold, the Frenchman Cornier and Jerome Simon, and Robert Miller. Le Mans has a good team with him this year. Approaching the Glandon summit, Clavarola has dropped Ingerin, and the new King of the Mountains leader beats out a steady rhythm of climbing. One complete turn of the pedals every second. To an enormous cheer, Tiddy Clavarola goes over the top of the climb. He's a local favourite and he's carved out a lead of 82 seconds. The man who is behind Tiddy Clavarola, it's still Miguel Ingerain. Three and a half minutes behind the leader, the main group comes up towards the summit of the Glandon, where they're led by a sprinting Chiapucci. Just like yesterday, Clavarola is again out in front by himself. On the long downhill, Clavarola is pursued by Ingerain, the more talented descender of the two. But Ingerain has been caught by Lamond, Bugno and Pedro Delgado. While the brave Clavarola continues his solo escapade, but he'll soon be caught. The chase is led by Ingerain, working for his team leader, Pedro Delgado. This is Delgado. The benefit of having a man on your team in the chase group. Greg Lamont has to defend the interest of his teammate as well, Ronan Pensek, and he follows the breakaway. Ingerain keeps up the ferocious pace ahead of the opportunist Gianni Bugno. His eyes are on a stage win in the finish at Alpe d'Huez. Clavarola will soon be caught by this breakaway group. In which the stylish Indurain is doing the work of two men on this windswept road. Bugno follows and so too does Indurain's teammate 
Delgado. Indurain is doing all of the pulling for Delgado, whose turn will come on the final climb. Neither Tall of Italy winner Gianni Bugno, nor the ambitious Eduardo Chozas is helping Indurain. While Greg Lamont still follows as well. And Tiddy Clavarola tries to recuperate from his long solo break. Two minutes behind, Sean Kelly leads the chase with teammate Eric Birking, while the yellow jersey of Pensex simply follows. Then in Bourgoisin, with the Alpe d'Huez climb in sight ahead, Indurain finally sits up and drops away, leaving the other five to battle out the stage. Delgado immediately takes charge on the climb, pressurizing Bugno, Chozas, Le Monde and Clavarola. Two and a half minutes behind, Robert Miller and Claudie Coquillion leads the chase for Pensec, as Birkink follows on comfortably behind them all. Clavarola cannot keep pace on this steepest part of the 13 kilometers climb and he too falls back. This leaves just Bugno and Le Monde in Delgado's wake. Behind Indurain is caught and passed by the chase group. It's still being headed by Claude Coquillion, while Chiapucci, Colombian rider Abelardo Rondon and Pensec look quite at ease. Robert Miller rides particularly hard, followed by his teammate Pensec, Coquillion and Andy Hampston. Pensec is defending his yellow jersey with energy and honour, focusing totally on the slim figure ahead of him, of a seemingly tireless Robert Miller. Remarkably, Clavarola is catching back to the leaders. Delgado has suddenly tired, while Greg Lamont still follows and Bugno still waits. The Alpe d'Huez climb is seeing yet another epic battle. Eric Birkink has ridden away from the chasers. And three kilometers from the summit, after a magnificent chase, he catches the four leaders. Behind, Andy Hampson is showing his best climbing form for years, as Pensek hangs on at the back. At the front, Delgado is also dropped, as Birkink increases the pace. Poor Clavarola is struggling again. And this leaves only Bugno and Greg Lamond on the wheel of Brecking. And as the leaders head into Alpe d'Huez, the tour is again taking a decisive turn. Thierry Clavarola fights back yet again into contention, but he's dropped once more, as another acceleration by Birkin can only be followed by Greg Lamond and Gianni Bugno. They all want to win this most prestigious of stages. One kilometre from the finish now. The Colombian Fabio Parra is also catching up. Birking still leads and turns to see who's still with him. Para continues to approach Thierry Clavarola. And Pensec still follows Miller and Claude Coquillion. Through the ski village of Alpe d'Huez, this is now a classic battle. The three leaders are preparing their finishing effort and slow down. And Thierry Clavarola. Again, he sprints up to join them. Para joins the leaders as well, and five men head into the final corner, where Lamont dies between Bugno and Birking, and almost falls. Lamont manages to correct himself, and he leads out the sprint from Bugno. The others are beaten. At first, Lamont appears to be winning. But as the finish line approaches, Gianni Bugno is just too strong and takes Le Monde right on the line. 
He's the first Italian winner here since 1952. Crowd flock around the world's number one, Greg Lamond. But if you look at world rankings, you'll find that honor really belongs to Gianni Bagno. Bagno may have been the winner, but the Monde always attracts the media attention. They know that the American is now up to third place overall, and he's starting again to look like a potential winner of this tour. Greg Lamont loses his temper with a reporter telling him not to touch him. He'll answer questions only after he's cleaned up. Delgado's teammate Rondon leads Andy Hampson and his team leader up the final slope. And the exhausted Delgado loses only 40 seconds to Lamont. It could have been a lot worse. And for Andy Hampston, it was for him a very good day on Alp Duez. And for the veteran Claude Coquillon. While Pensek has exceeded all hopes by extending his overall lead over Claudio Chiapucci. He hasn't finished yet, while teammate Greg Lamond is still nine minutes behind on overall time. Could Pensek now be the new hero that French cycling has been seeking? Gianni Bugno too has proved himself. And Le Monde? Is this the kind of Alpe d'Huez ride you knew you had inside of you? Well, I wasn't certain of it, but uh, I've been feeling really good. I, I crashed for the second last climb, and I didn't think I'd be that good uh, on the climbs, but it kind of went into not shock, but it uh, shook me up quite a bit. Tell me about the last three kilometers. Uh, well, we were starting starting out on the climb. Pedro Delgado did all the pacing. I mean, I, I felt really good, and uh, you know, I had to do my work as a teammate. It was we had the lead, and it was only better that in climb. But uh, I felt kind of sorry for Pedro because he, he really rode strong, and we were practically standing still towards the last five kilometers, last few kilometers. And the main thing is, I wanted to win the stage, and uh, I was trying to control everybody, and uh, almost went down the last uh, last corner and had too big of a gear and let up. Too long and lost the stage. But, uh, it's, it's good to our team. We, I think we should be first and second. And, uh, and it's, it's good to our fans. Were you and Delgado working together in a sense today? No, 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 no. I, I uh, you know, you've got, you got team orders. I wasn't allowed to work. But it didn't really make. In the last climb, it made a lot of difference between Federal lost 40 seconds and. Uh, uh, we probably could have gained minutes over everybody else had I worked and uh, Bruno worked. But, uh, uh, everybody was wanting to win the stage and was too afraid to, you know, to do more work than the other guy. Earlier in the day, you had a crash. Yeah, I crashed. I uh, dis dislocated my middle finger. I had to pull it out. Sort of and that made a difference when you almost slipped in the last turn. Well, yeah, I my, my, uh, went to uh, pull on my brakes and my fingers locked up. It was straight, I couldn't bend it. And uh, that's why I couldn't hit my brakes well enough. So I almost took went down the last, just lost 300 meters. And now what are you expecting for the time trials tomorrow? I don't know. It's, no time trials aren't my specialty. I hope to have a good one, but I don't expect to win. I expect to be close. You have a superstition about the Lauf Duez stage. Well, I said it's, uh, I'd it's not so bad that I lost because those, it's always been the, the uh, tradition that if you win Love to Us, you don't win the Tour de France. So that's uh, maybe a good point. It's like uh, a second, maybe still a possibility of winning. If not, we've won the races as a team. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, Lamont can now focus on tomorrow's vital time trial near Grenoble. The course climbs for 13 kilometers through 2,000 vertical feet to a plateau and it ends with another sharp climb near Villard de Lons. It's a ride of 33 and a half kilometers. This is Marina Lajareta, one of the dark horses, who sets out with great determination. The 34 years old Spaniard is one of the best climbers in the world. He loves the Tour de France as well. Lajareta's time is easily the fastest so far, and he catches several riders on his way. 
At the finish, he records 57 minutes, 46 seconds, lifting him into the top 10 overall. Meanwhile, out on the course, Indurain is another favourite for the stage, despite having lost 12 minutes at Al Duez, where he sacrificed his tour chance for Delgado. With one kilometre to go, he's a few seconds ahead of La Giretta. And he finishes just nine seconds quicker. Indurain's teammate Delgado won a time trial like this in his winning 1988 tour. And he's putting in a similar effort this time for a possible repeat performance. By the time he finishes, he'll be leading by 13 seconds. One rider hoping to better Delgado's time is Greg LeMond. Who, against his instinct, is using a disc wheel for the hill climb. The American does indeed struggle on the longest climb and is 20 seconds slower than Delgado at this point after 22 kilometers. Le Mans makes use of his aero bars and disc wheel on the flat. But he toils at the final steep gradient. And at the line, he falls short by 26 seconds of Delgado's time. The world champion's not interested now in talking to the media. Only Eric Birkin can now displace Pedro Delgado. The Dutchman is a smooth, powerful peddler, whose poker face doesn't reveal the energy he expends. Eric Birkin finishes in 56 minutes, 52 seconds, the best time by 30 seconds. Now comes the battle for the yellow jersey. Claudio Chiapucci has to make up 88 seconds to overcome Ronan Pensek. The 27 years old Italian has a jerky style. But nonetheless, he is climbing very quickly. He confidently tackles the final hill and then he sprints across the finishing line in 57 minutes, 57 seconds, the eighth best time. But is it too good for Pensek? The yellow jersey is laboring up the final climb. Unlike on Alp Duez, the weight on his shoulders today was just too much. Ronan Pensek finishes 49th. He's lost almost three minutes to Claudio Chiapucci and the yellow jersey has gone in this Tour de France for good. It's the first yellow jersey for Italy in 20 years. Chiapucci has emerged from the Alps with a seven minutes lead over the favourites. That's an enormous gap. Defending the leader's jersey now is new to Chiapucci and his Carrera team will need to be careful on this hilly 13th stage from Villard de Lens to Saint Etienne. The field are happy to be going away from the steep climbs of the Alps. Frenchman Laurent Biondi is one rider though who needs attention from the race doctor. He's suffering from heat sickness and takes a pill to steady his dizziness. Tour de France has a tremendous backup team. The only thing the doctors can't do is ride the bicycle. A Carrera rider crashes, and with him, a rider from Helvetia La Suisse is also down. And Dutchman Martin Ducrot needs a pain killing spray after another crash. In the pack, Claudio Chiapucci moves up, shadowed by Miguel Indurain. The race leader is nervous about a 30-man breakaway which contains Ronan Pensek, and it's gained 90 seconds. With his yellow jersey endangered, Chiapucci joins his teammates to chase down the dangerous move. 
needs a tremendous effort under the midday sun. Greg Lamont counter-attacks with Indurain, Hampston and Eric Drepping and they soon pass the remnants of the breakaway. Surprised by the attack, Delgado and Bunyo chase desperately with La Jaleta. They're already 90 seconds behind. Miguel Indurain is told to wait, but he takes a quick drink first. In front, Hampston comfortably follows Eduardo Chozas, Eric Birking, and the energetic Greg LeMond. The defending tour champion knows that he has to make up every second and minute he can on the precocious Chiapucci. Approaching the summit of the Poix de Chaubure climb, LeMond still leads Birking, Hampston, Chozas, and Roberto Conti. Behind, Indurain has closed the gap to only 20 seconds and momentarily sits up to wave Bunyo, Delgado and La Jareta through. Back down the mountainside, an exhausted Chiapucci is all alone, with no teammates strong enough to help him now. And at the top, the yellow jersey leads a small group more than four minutes behind. In front, Greg Lamont piles on the pressure. He now has a chance to take time out of Chiapucci. While Indurain again leads the chases at 60 miles an hour on the swerving descent towards St Etienne. Lamont rides flat out all of the way to the finish, where he's content to watch his companions fight out the stage result. And that goes to Eduardo Chozas on the left from Eric Breffing. Lamont's attack has blown the race wide open. Kiapucci is almost five minutes behind. Pensek, nearly eight. What was the situation with you and Delgado? What were you aware of in terms of you two during the, particularly the end of the race? Delgado, I did. I know we were. I wasn't sure how much we had in front of him. I don't. I wasn't. I, I had no idea until I finished the race how much time I had on Delgado. And with regard to Penzek today, uh, I wasn't paying attention. I was thinking of eliminating Capucci, and uh, Delgado was behind. A lot of riders were behind. You intended coming into this race to ride it hard and make everyone else ride a hard race. Did you do it to your satisfaction? Oh, I think there are some people who are suffering today. Yeah. And how about you? Oh, no, I felt, I felt great. I mean, I felt great until the last two kilometers. I just all of a sudden ran out of liquids. I got like what we call the bonk, uh, just the last two kilometers. And how important, though, was it for you to win this stage? I don't even think about winning this stage. I'm thinking about winning the Tour de France. So what about tomorrow? Another day that's going to be difficult. I mean, these days are very dangerous. It's really hot, hard. Uh, anything can happen. But I'm, I'm confident I'll be good tomorrow, too. Were the mountain climbs harder today because of the heat? Oh, I'm sure that it wasn't a hard climb. It was made the day harder, yeah. Again, I think a lot of people were dehydrated. Uh, I was getting there at the end. Yeah, you seem a little bit spaced. I am. I'm like out of oxygen. It's like yeah. dizzy. Sit down if you want. I want to get out of here. Thanks, Greg. The 14th stage traverses the hills of central France to a mountain top finish at Miao. It's a ride of 205 kilometers. The start is at the medieval town of Le Puy, complete with a firing cannon. 168 survivors climb away from the town, facing five hours again in the saddle. The attacks soon begin, with five breaks developing in the opening half of the stage. There is a long descent into the Tarn Gorge with 60 kilometers to go. where the peloton is still riding slowly crossing the river and heading downstream towards Miao. Frenchman Jean-Claude Bagot has broken clear of the front group. 
He hopes for a stage win. But the peloton behind has finally started to move. Descending quicker than most, the Italian rider Bruno Kengialta catches up with Jean-Claude Bago. And together they start to work. French champion Philippe Luvio also tries to catch the leaders. But the pack is getting closer as the final finishing climb approaches. And as Volzvol leads team leader Greg LeMond up the mountain at Miao, the breakaways have been wiped out. The pack is together at the front. It's a long climb to the finish. A sudden attack comes from the normally passive La Diretta, and he puts in a massive effort. He doesn't know whether our rider is still ahead of him or not. This charismatic Basque rider once had a fan protect him from the rain on the Spanish climb by running alongside him, holding an umbrella. But today, La Diretta needs no help at all. A look over his shoulder and the gap is there. La Jareta decides to keep going. There's a chase from behind by Gianni Bugno and that man, Miguel Ingerain, having a marvellous Tour de France. Then comes a Colombian, William Palacio, he also takes up the pursuit. And the small group behind has again dropped Claudio Chiapucci, the yellow jersey. Greg Lamond and Delgado step on the gas together. And they are followed by Palaccio and the rest of the pack. Raul Alcala is the last rider of the group. By the finish, Marino Lajareta has stayed away on his own, but he still believes there are other riders in front of him, and he forgoes the normal victory salute. 24 seconds later, Miguel Ingerain rides away from Bugno to take second, while Alcala spins from the back to take fourth from the Mond and Breking. So to stage 15, the roads are flatter as the riders face 170 kilometers from Milau to Ravel. This area in the south of France is steeped in history from Roman times. For the riders, there is no initial need to hurry, as the next battleground for Le Mans, Chiapucci, Delgado and Breking is the upcoming Pyrenees. On the lesser climbs, the battle still remains though for points in the King of the Mountains title. But for a while, the field in general rolls along together. Charlie Motte, who lost his chance of winning this race in the Alps, is anxious to show himself as a stage contender at least. And the Frenchman attacks at every opportunity, attempting to start a breakaway move that might help him win the day. Caught, Motte keeps the pressure on and is soon ahead again. This time he has a strong ally in his teammate and King of the Mountains leader, Tiri Clavarola. Clavarola continues to enjoy a great tour as well. Tour leaders watch from afar as Motte's group gains ground. Thirty kilometers from Ravel, Motte breaks clear alone, loading up with drink for the final push to the finish. Charlie Motte finished second in this year's Tour of Italy, hence the reason for making him a pre-tour favourite. He's also one of the finest riders when racing alone at speed, and his lead quickly builds to over three minutes. The tour leaders have no longer any interest in Charlie Motte, so he continues to gain time. 
He plays to an enormous crowd on top of the last climb of the day. France and Motte were finally enjoying a great day out. He arrives at the finish over two minutes in front, with no change overall among the leaders, except that a split in the field near the end has given Pia Pucci a bonus of a few seconds gain over Greg Lamont. Low cloud, green countryside and a chill wind. It has to be the beautiful Pyrenees that tower above France and Spain. And it's here where those with thoughts of victory must now prove their qualifications. It's all uphill from Blagnac via the Col d'Aspin and the Col de Tourmalet to Luz Ardidon. A ride of 215 kilometers, not surprisingly, Claudio Chiapucci fuels up for a day he knows will be both testing and painful. The first challenge is the Col d'Aspin, the lowest of the day's climbs, and usually a stepping stone of no great difficulty. But today things are different. A small group of riders is ahead, and while the field behind questions the move, even thinking of it as suicide, Kia Pucci, the race leader, is acting just like that, a race leader. He sets a tough pace. Kia Pucci was not interested in the help of the lesser men who had taken up the challenge with him. For days, everyone had talked about this stage, and how much time the Italian would lose. No one had expected this, least of all the other tour hopefuls who kept up a rhythm behind without too much effort yet. Chiapucci, since that first day breakaway, has warmed to the feeling of wearing yellow. If he was going to lose this race, he intended to do so in the finest traditions of the Tour de France. The attack was on and the decision was now for others to make. Relentlessly, Chiapucci kept the pressure on as he raced through the corridor of people towards the top of the Col d'Aspin. He gives way only for the sprinters to snatch the mountain points. He has a far bigger prize in mind. His lead over the first climb is just 34 seconds as he and his group of 10 begin the race down towards the base of the Col du Tourmalet. Goodness knows what Chiapucci's breakaway companions are thinking, but the yellow jersey now has a lead of over a minute, and the tour is taking on a new dimension. Greg Lamond, his racing jersey wide open, must be wondering too, what is happening? Surely Chiapucci can't keep up such an attack, and he fights to limit the gains with two mountains still to come. The Col de Tourmalet, a brute of a climb that just goes up and up, it's here where Le Monde and the other leaders hope that Chiapucci will prove the error of his attack. But at the start of the climb, his lead is up to almost three minutes. Claudie Coquillion, the champion of Belgium, is also having a great tour, but there is still no sign of the names expected at the front. On through the mountain resort of La Mangie, and Chiapucci, his group thinning out, is left now with only the Belgian Johan Brunil and the Italian Roberto Conti. Neither rider has a chance of winning the Tour de France, but they are both proving to be valuable allies to Chiapucci. Pedro Delgado, riding on the edge of his own country, is being forced to follow rather than lead on his favourite terrain. He relies on teammate Miguel Ingeré, while Greg Lamond relies on his teammate Bruno Cornier. The chase seems at last to be beginning, and Spaniard Miguel Martinez Torres avoids the confusion by going ahead of Kier Butchie's group by himself. Kier Pucci, out in front since the start of the Aspen, still has Brunil and three other riders for company. But when you are the race leader, you tend to have to do all of the work. 
while Greg LeMond here and Pedro Delgado rely on their teammates to set the pace. Another huge crowd on the summit of the Tourmalet sees Martinez Torres climbing to a three minute advantage. It wasn't quite the name the crowd expected to see, but as many are Spanish here anyway, the nationality is pleasing them. This gives you an idea as to just how steep the final corners of the Tourmalet are, and Torres climbs it very well. The newspaper, by the way, is not for a read on the way down. It's for keeping the cold wind off the chest. The riders continue to climb the mountain, but still there are the top names not evident. Just the riders who escaped in the early breakaway with Kia Pucci. As so often happens when the champion leads the attack, other riders tend to slip away off the front. So unusually, the top names in this Tour de France were still to pass over the summit. A long, hard road to the top of the Col de Tourmalet. Kierpucci was still riding behind as the leaders go over the top. The yellow jersey, still with Conti, Brunil, Regis Simon, reaches the top. Just the descent, and then the last climb and the finish to come. Conti outspins Kierpucci for the banner. Behind, Thierry Clavarola scores well again to consolidate his lead in the King of the Mountains competition. Last year, the Frenchman was forced out of the Tour de France when he crashed while leading in the same competition. More than two minutes later, the elite group heads towards the summit led by Marino Lajareta on the left and the tall Miguel Indurain. Delgado is in the centre and Le Mans tracks the back wheel of Indurain on the right. Others in the group include Fabio Parra from Colombia and Dmitriev Konishev, the fast improving Soviet rider. Indurain is a revelation in this Tour de France. Surely now he must regret having played such an unselfish role in the Alps to help Delgado. The group goes over the top knowing that the chase must be fast and determined if Kia Pucci, the brilliant Kia Pucci, is to be brought back to heel. Miguel Martinez Torres has no illusions of winning the Tour de France, just a stage. He is far too far behind overall. While Greg LeMond launches the attack on the descent to cut back the lead of Kia Pucci, now only just ahead. chase downhill lasts for more than 20 minutes at speeds of 90 kilometers an hour. The checks indicate though that Kierpucci will soon be caught. And so he is. At the base of the final climb, the yellow jersey is caught after an attack that will find a place in the colorful history of the Tour de France. Kierpucci still sits at the front of the reformed field as the final climb begins, but now he has the most feared names alongside him, except that of Eric Brekink, who's had a mechanical problem and a bad day in the Pyrenees. Greg Lamond has chased for most of the day. He has now caught his quarry, the race leader, the Mayo Jean, and he sits and watches him. The face of Lamond gives nothing away. It appears he's climbing very well indeed. Kier Pucci is trailed by Miguel Indurain, Greg Lamond, Pedro Delgado and Claude Coquillion. Nobody's really interested in the poor old Miguel Torres, who still rides just ahead thinking of a stage win. And nobody wants to help either the Mayo Jean. Fabio Parra attacks on the right and Greg Lamond is the first to react. Marino Lajareta takes Le Mans wheel. Conti follows, and soon everybody has moved across the road. There's one man, though, who finds he can't. The yellow jersey of Claudio Chiapucci is falling back. 
the gamble of the day appears now to have been the biggest mistake of the day. As the group containing Greg LeMond and all of the tour favourites except Eric Brecken goes clear, Claudio Chiapucci is now having to fight to keep the race lead. The only thing in his favour is the time he holds in hand over the riders going ahead of him. Around a hairpin bend, the Le Mans group rapidly go away. At last, Greg Le Mans has got the move he was looking for, a chance to distance the man in yellow. The world champion, who started the season so badly, so out of form, was finding it on the day that mattered most, the road to Luz Ardiden. Cathy Lamont watches on television on the peak summit. And what she sees is what she hoped she would see. Her husband Greg driving the pace. Miguel Indurain, Marina Lajareta are the only two riders now who have matched the speed of Greg Lamont. Surprisingly, Pedro Delgado has dropped away. But Delgado hasn't dropped away quite as far as the yellow jersey of Claudio Chiapucci. He still lived in hope that he would lead the tour by the end of the day. This is Delgado trying desperately now to salvage a few seconds before the finish. He breaks away from Claudio Cotillion and Andy Hampston. But Bruno Cornier finds the strength from somewhere to catch up with Delgado. The mountains should have been the favourite hunting ground for Pedro, as they were when he won the Tour de France back in 1988, but he hasn't produced the same form this year. Greg Lamond was receiving absolutely no help at all from the two Spanish riders, Lecheretta, and at the back, Miguel Indurain. They had no intention of helping him either, they were searching, in fact, just for the stage win here on the Spanish borders. After all, all the flags were the Basque variety. Le Monde was thinking now in terms of seconds. Every second he gained over the field meant a second closer than Mayo Jean of the Tour de France. And so, with three kilometres to go, Lagiretta was dropped off the back, while Lagiretta's teammate, Miguel Martinez Torres, was finally caught. He'd been off the front. Now there was nobody in front of these two riders. It was purely a matter of which one would win and how much time they would gain over the yellow jersey. Further down the mountain, the yellow jersey was still in serious trouble. Towards the top, Greg Lamont was riding with an inspiration he'd never shown before in this year's Tour de France. And surely, too, Miguel Indurain was badly regretting now, waiting for his teammate Pedro Delgado down in the valley road towards the climb of Alp d'Huez. Because had he not lost so much time on that day, he might have been a real challenger now to Greg Lamont and Claudio Chiapucci. Luzardi Den was becoming one of the most famous climbs in the Tour de France, just like Alpe d'Huez did in the last decade. Just look at the people here now. They had come from far and wide. This was a great festive day, but it was above all the day that they thought the Tour de France would be decided. And we'd have to wait for the clock to start counting before anybody could say that. Into the last few kilometres for the two leaders, Claudio Cotillion was trying desperately now to drop even Pedro Delgado, while behind them all was the yellow jersey still toiling and suffering of Chiapucci. No help at all for Greg Lamond. He was having to win this Tour de France purely on his own strength, if indeed he was going to win it. 
Lamont knew he needed time and needed it on this climb because tomorrow there is no great climbs on the course. It would leave just one time trial before the finish in Paris. He needed time and he needed it now over Claudio Chiapucci. He was not concerned about the stage victory and quite clearly that most certainly was in the mind of Miguel Indurain who was waiting for his moment. But he didn't fancy water over the back of his neck either. The finish is as high as you can see. There are still a few uphill slopes to come, but you'd never see them through this crap. And the cheers were still there too for Claudio Chiapucci. For anybody watching it on television all day, they know just what a great ride he put in. The crowd narrowed the road down to just the width of a car. And Greg Lamont picks his way through and never once turns round to ask Indurain for help. To the final bend, and at last Miguel Indurain lines up for the finish. Greg Lamond is grateful for his back wheel, but not for long. Indurain applies the pressure just enough to crack the world champion. Greg Lamond's pace making up the hill had been formidable, but Indurain now was thinking only of the stage victory. It reminded one a little bit of the battle between Greg Lamond and Donald Fignon a year ago on top of the Col de Perisord and Super Bagnier. Then, of course, it was Fignon going clear. This time, it was injury. Round the final bend, the finish banner was in sight, and after seven hours of riding at an incredible average speed of 39 kilometers an hour, the Spaniard Miguel Indurain wins this classic stage. Greg Lamond arrived just six seconds behind him. And then the media move in. C'est le Colombien, Sarah, il y a maintenant une minute et sept secondes que Miguel Andurain a franchi la ligne d'arrivée. Voilà Fabio Parra qui termine avec un retard. Claude Aquilion came in as well, Marina Lagiretto had finished third. Martinez Torres had taken fourth place. Still no sign, though, of the yellow jersey. Had Greg Lamont taken the race lead? The clock was counting down. Claudio Chiapucci was alone now. He'd been alone for most of the day, really, because nobody had been willing to help him. He sprinted up to the line with the clock still counting down, and when he crossed it, he'd kept his yellow jersey by just five seconds. No, 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 je, je me sens très, très bon, je veux. Greg, Greg, you're just five seconds, seconds behind the jersey. Do you think Perfect. you the jersey now? Uh, it's not one until the time trial, but uh, it looks very good. Well, you know the time trial. You know the time trial at Lake de Basuvier because you went there in 85. You lost the maillot jaune for five seconds. You lost the maillot jaune. Oui, mais... It's okay. It's okay. So, Greg, you know the, you know the time trial in Lake de Basuvier. You yeah. must feel confident. I, I feel very confident. You know, I think I can beat Cappuccino. If I can't, then I don't deserve to win. Five seconds separating you and the yellow jersey right now, Greg. Uh, I think uh, I'm very confident I can win because uh, I know I'm better than Cappuccino time trials. The last one's especially good for me, and I feel totally fresh. Was your strategy just constant attack at the finish? Well, I wasn't sure how everybody felt. I tell you, I went into the stage not. I thought all I had to do was follow Delgado. I thought Delgado would be the one who attacked. Uh, 
but when I saw Kepachi was gone in the break and nobody responded on the Tour Malay, I said, uh, uh, it's just, it's just, we're going to let him go. And uh, I said, it's all or nothing. And I'm glad I did it because I think I uh, killed Delgado. He had to come back to me. And uh, we raced a race that was superb with the team. Did you think the Tour de France might be won today in this oh, stage? It's won today. It's, it's not over to Champs Elysees, but if I'm going to win, it's won today, no doubt. I, I'm, uh, it's, I can't say what the percentage, but it's a very, very good percentage that I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe win. Thank you. Thank you. So we go on. The 18th of July, the roads are a little bit flatter, 150 kilometers, taking them from Lourdes across to Po. Normally in the Tour de France, Po is the gateway to the Pyrenees. This time, it was the way out. Before leaving the religious center of France, the riders did a circuit of the city. The major climb of the day, the Col de Marie Blanc. But as soon as the race got underway, the radio tour was announcing riders giving up, and they announced the abandon of the rider Guido Winterberg. There'll be more of those this day as well. But still in the yellow jersey, Claudio Chiapucci, who survived his most difficult day to keep his lead by just five seconds. Remember the day when it was once ten minutes? The climb of the Col de la Morie Blanc, the crowds again had turned out in their tens of thousands. They were waiting for the moment when the yellow jersey would change shoulders. This time, the field, in the beginning at least, stayed largely together. The yellow jersey riding well, never far from the race lead. There were always those willing to test, to attack and hope they could escape. There was really now only a handful of riders left in this race for the final kill in Paris. Others were looking for the stage win. After all, every day was a big prize day if you could win the prize money. Over the top of the Col de la Marie Blanc, the field were all together. All that mattered that was, and Greg LeMond was feeling in buoyant mood. Five seconds off the lead, and no pressure yet to defend the yellow jersey. That was still the priority of Claudio Chiapucci. But this day wasn't to be quite as simple as that. There are other things in the world apart from the human body, like punctures. And Greg LeMond was going to get one very shortly that could well change the face of this Tour de France. On the way down the Marie Blanc, Greg LeMond has a flat tyre. He is now in big trouble. He was left on the roadside with no team around him, no team car to help him, and he stood there for three minutes. The field ahead raced on. Eric Berking was now having a chance to pull back time he'd lost earlier in the Pyrenees. Marino Lagiretta was still a real challenger in this race. Andy Hampston, who wouldn't attack Greg LeMond necessarily, was now in the front group as well. Gilles de Lyon. They were all here now, all thinking of gaining ground over the bad luck of Greg LeMond. Pedro Delgado was driving the pace too. Urs Zimmermann, Massimo Girotto. All of the teammates here of Claudio Chiapucci were driving the pace. Strangely, at the time of the puncture, there had been a small breakaway, and LeBron's teammates were in that leading group. They'd now been ordered back to await their stricken leader. They're not allowed to turn round and go back towards the race. That is totally against the rules. So they were ordered to stop and wait on the roadside by the team manager, Roger Leger. LeMond comes up at high speed. His team now were dragging him back into the race. It was a marvellous exhibition of team riding. Greg LeMond was being paced back up to the lead pack of Claudio Chiapucci by his teammates. Had this happened a year ago, LeMond may never have rejoined the leaders because only one rider in his team finished alongside him, Johan Lammertz. So, on a day when LeMond got a scare, he came back into the race leader frame. 
and then the little men are allowed the chance to win the stage. It's always a poor phrase to use, little men. Anybody that wins a stage in the Tour de France is a great cyclist, and this was also an historic day down in Po. On the left of the screen, Dmitry Konishev became the first Soviet rider ever to win a stage of the Tour de France. He beat Tour first-timer Johan Brunil. In third place, the Canadian Steve Bauer, 11 seconds back, and the fourth place sprint was won by Jean-Claude Colotti. And so to stage 18, 202 kilometers, heading out to Bordeaux, the hot flatlands. At the start of the stage, Greg LeMond was busy telling the press how unhappy he was that Claudio Chiapucci had chosen to attack him when he was stricken by a puncture. He said it simply wasn't sporting. So there seemed to be a little bit of rivalry beginning between Greg LeMond and Claudio Chiapucci and it wasn't just a sporting one. Traditionally, Bordeaux is the hottest part of France. The riders were ready for that. And Greg Lamond, of course, was thinking now of the time trial when he hopefully would take the race lead. Stephen Roach takes a letter in from home. Others make telephone calls. And Greg Lamond, for the moment at least, the pressure is off. And so the bunch rolled along, fairly much together for all of the day, until they came close towards the finish, and the Australian Phil Anderson was out to try and win the stage. A small group developed at the head of the field, and was gradually picking up strength in numbers. Phil Anderson was the animator. The main field was always hunting them down. Claudio Chiapucci had had a painless day. He never allowed Greg LeMond out of his sight. After all, a five second gap, that could be so easily taken at any time if you don't shadow your man. Coming towards the finish, a small breakaway group did develop. Surprisingly, Gianni Bugno, the winner at Alpe d'Huez, was the inspiration of the move. Taking with him his teammate, Roberto Guzmaroli, and also Eric Berking. Just ahead of the main field, it was the Italian Bugno who wins his second stage. Eric Berking finished second, and he makes an amazing 18-second gain, which could be important, over all of the tour leaders led home here by Giovanni Fidenza. Stage 19, 102 and a half kilometers. And again, between Castillon and Limoges, nothing really was expected to happen. The riders were now becoming very keyed up for the final time trial. The big showdown between Greg LeMond and Claudio Chiapucci. The green jersey being worn here by Olaf Ludwig in his first Tour de France is awarded to the most consistent daily finisher. He'd won one stage and he'd taken part in many of the bunch sprints near the front in others. Lamont takes time out to have a chat with tour organiser Jean-Marie Leblanc, himself a former tour rider. All these things were the sign that there was not going to be a lot of action from the leaders this day. Lamont even had time for a mechanical problem as well. and by picking his way through the convoy, he soon rejoins the field. And then a late breakaway and a fine piece of solo riding by Guido Bontempi of Italy. His vast experience and his recovering from injury, he's realized the leaders are taking a sort of day off. He's broken clear and wins the stage by one minute and 28 seconds. The Carreras are having a great tour. The lead with Chiapucci and now a stage win. So too, the penultimate day of the Tour de France, a time trial around Lac de Fassivière, the beautiful centre of the Limoges countryside. It's a ride of 45 and a half kilometres. Greg Lamont knows he must perform this day better than ever before to win the leader's yellow jersey. 
The same could be said of Claudio Chiapucci, who has to keep the leader's yellow jersey. During three weeks, Claudio Chiapucci has become a great star. He's all set now to win the Tour de France. All that prevents him is the time trial, 45 and a half kilometers. The time trial is a mass of concentration. Raoul Alcala here is ready for the off. Already the winner of one time trial in this year's Tour de France, Raoul Alcala is the only Mexican to ever win a stage of the Tour de France. He's won one this year, and he won one last year in Belgium at Spa Francorchamps. And so far at all of the time checks, he's all set now to win another one. Raoul Alcala approaches the finish with a great time. It's the fastest so far, and he crosses the line with a time of one hour, three minutes and eight seconds. Pedro Delgado will not be aware of what Alcala has done as he sets off. Delgado needs a very good performance to beat this rider, Eric Brerking. They're fighting out now at least the third place on the podium in Paris. Eric Brerking sets off too. Jan Gispers' his team manager cheers him all of the way. Delgado is down at the time checks to Brerking. He's going to have to find an extraordinarily good finish to beat the Dutchman. With a ride of one hour and five minutes, Delgado knows that won't be good enough to beat Dutchman Eric Brerking. And when Eric Brerking comes up to the finishing line, he's recording the best time of the day so far. One hour, two minutes and 40 seconds. 28 seconds better than Raoul Alcala. That surely now has confirmed a top three finish in Paris. Unconcerned about the ride of Brerking are these two men. They are in a personal battle for yellow. And Greg Lamont starts ahead of Claudio Chiapucci. Greg Lamont knows the circuit. He also has happy memories here because in 1985, he won his first ever stage of the Tour de France around this very course. On that occasion, he beat the legendary Bernard Eno. Eno, of course, going on to win the Tour de France and Greg Le Mans to finish second. Claudio Chiapucci departs behind Greg Lamont. Both leaders are now on course. The Europeans call this the race of truth. There's no hiding behind anybody. There's no saying you feel ill. There's no blaming anything at all. Only your legs. Greg Lamont was rapidly into his stride. His time checks were good and consistently faster than Claudio Chiapucci's at every time check. Greg Lamont knew by the support from his following car he was now racing to the yellow jersey of the Tour de France just 24 hours before the finish. Approaching the finishing line, Greg Lamond was well outside the winning time of Eric Brerking. But it was a time of 1 hour, 3 minutes and 37 seconds. It should be a lot better than Claudio Chiapucci. The media move in for the kill as well, and Lamond was having none of it. And sure enough, Claudio Chiapucci approaches the finish, riding his last day in the Tour de France in the yellow jersey. His time, one hour, five minutes and 58 seconds. Two minutes, 21 seconds slower than Greg Lamont. And so, the famous four, the four riders who dominated this race from day one, were now all behind the new leader, Greg Lamont of the United States. In yellow, and one day to come.
A train journey to the outskirts of Paris will start the final stage of 182 and a half kilometers from Bretigny to Paris in the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe and of course the famous Eiffel Tower. The whole field comes into Paris together. Nobody is behind the race and nobody in front. You know, when the riders finally see the Eiffel Tower, everyone will tell you they break out in large goose pimples. They are so motivated after a long three weeks in the saddle. What they fear most is being dropped from the peloton in the view of the world on the famous Champs-Élysées. But the field stays together. As time after time, it goes up and down the most sacred cobbled roads in the world. Greg LeMond is in yellow. Claudio Chiapucci is in second place. Eric Birking is in third place. And the Z team of Greg LeMond makes sure he has no problems. They dominate the head of the field. Lap after lap of the Champs-Élysées, the pace is kept so high nobody can escape off the front. Eric Birking rides behind Greg LeMond, Claudio Chiapucci on the far side of him. These are the men who've been the stars in this year's Tour de France, and this day wasn't going to change anything. Greg LeMond, the first American to win the Tour de France in 1986, he did it again so dramatically last year by eight seconds on this very road in a time trial when he beat Lon and Fignon. And now this year, he's going to win again. Guarded by his faithful teammate, Gilbert Duclos Lazal, number four. Everybody wants to win the final stage of the Tour de France on the Champs Elysees in Paris. It's normally reserved for the sprinters those greyhound of men who can usually go faster than anybody else at any time. And so it was to prove in the big sprint finish, Johan Museo, who'd won the stage at Mont Saint-Michel on the Normandy coastline, was home again. This time, he was finishing ahead of Adriano Baffi, the Italian, who tried so hard to win a stage, and he never quite got there. And so the American Greg LeMond has won his third Tour de France, and this is the result. Greg LeMond of the United States and the French Z team, the 3,400 kilometers in 90 hours, 43 minutes and 20 seconds. A superb average speed of 37.519 kilometers an hour. In second place, and he'll never be the same again, he'll always be a star now, Claudio Chiapucci of Italy and Carrera, two minutes, 16 seconds behind LeMond. Eric Birking from the Netherlands and the Dutch PDM team, two minutes, 29 seconds back. Pedro Delgado, third last year, he finishes fourth this time from Spain, five minutes and one second behind. And fifth, the most consistent stage race rider in the world, Marina Lajareta of Spain, five minutes, five seconds back. And in sixth place, Eduardo shows us of Spain at nine minutes, 14 seconds. And so for the second year running, Greg LeMond on the Champs-Élysées wears the leaders and the winners yellow jersey. The Tour de France, he feels, is his by right. He's always inspired when he rides it. And yet all of the season this year, no one would have bet on Greg LeMond to win the Tour de France. Once the race started, then you'd been a fool if you didn't. Eric Birking on the right, the rider who has finally been persuaded into riding a good Tour de France. He joined the Dutch PDM team this year under the guidance of Jan Gispers. And he's come up with a great ride to take third place. And Claudio Chiapucci, a superstar this year, a man who started showing great form in Paris-Nice when he won the King of the Mountains back in March. And this year, after that first day breakaway, has finished in second place. The victorious team of the Tour de France 1919, Greg LeMond, and the riders who helped him win the most coveted trophy in world cycling. And as Greg LeMond would be the first to say, you need a team and you can't win without them.